Good morning, everyone. It's Wednesdays with Willa. I've got Tom Kratzley here. We're just about to start the Blog Talk Radio show in a couple seconds. Oh. You can say hi to everyone if you want to. Oh, yeah. hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have a great show about Angie Jackson Davis. And if anybody wants the weather report in Lily Dale, we we have getting more snow. Yes, more snow. <laughs> We're supposed to get how many inches? I don't know, maybe half. You know, six yeah. inches, half, yeah. half a foot. Yeah. We get more than our fair short share, in my opinion. <laughs> you do. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Wednesdays with Willa. I am your host, Willa White, and you are listening to Lilydale Radio. This is my radio show where you can come and chat with me and my special guests on various topics. And we're very fortunate today to have with us Tom Kratzley. So thank you for being here today, Tom. Oh, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> Uh, we're going to have a great discussion about Andrew Jackson Davis. You're going to know who he is by the end of the show and uh, be able to take some knowledge with you and use it. So I want to give people a few housekeeping things uh, to begin with. If you want to call into the show and ask Tom uh, or me questions about Andrew Jackson Davis, you can use the call-in number, which is 818-739-8818. Again, 818-739-8818. Uh, there are two ways to listen to the show. Uh, one is through blogtalkradio.com slash Radio, And we've got uh, four shows you can tune into uh, throughout the week. And the other way is on my Facebook page, which is Willa White Medium. And you can like and share and follow and all that good stuff. And know when I'm going live with my next show or next uh uh, thing I want to share with all of you. So uh, you can also find me on my website, which is willowwhite.com. So hello everyone as you're coming on board. We appreciate you listening today. So as I said, our topic today is Andrew Jackson Davis, and we have Tom Kratzley here, who is a resident of Lilydale. How about you tell them a little bit about yourself, Tom, so you have a sense of who you are. Well, yeah, I think the best way to start is to talk about, about my introduction to spiritualism, and um, that began in 1968, it was a long time ago, and uh, at that time I was a member of a metaphysical coffee clutch at the University of Buffalo. Uh -huh. And the subject of Lilydale came up and it was going to be a road trip, of course. Of course. So we came from Buffalo up here and it, uh, on, a, on a sunny um, July afternoon, and we all got introduced to uh, spiritualism. And what, what really brought me here and inspired me the most was the Healing Temple. And yeah. so within short order, within a, 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 a couple of years, I started coming every summer and, and eventually serving in the Healing Temple every summer. Uh, and I also, as... Um, luck would have it, I also discovered that there was a spiritualist church in my neighborhood while I was in college, and I spent some time there going to classes, studying with uh, Reverend Wendling, oh, yes. Edith Sandy Wendling, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, uh, Reverend Wendling had an interesting history too, because she studied with Arthur Conan Doyle as a child. Which is incredible, yeah. and amazing, and special. <laughs> yeah, very special, because Arthur Conan Doyle was certainly one of the great researchers um, in uh, in the paranormal in the paranormal in field paranormal. altogether, altogether, um, but also a uh, very much committed to spiritualism as a philosophy. He wrote the history of spiritualism, yeah. not yeah. just the Sherlock Holmes stories. Right, <laughs> right. So anyway, so that's part of the lineage that I was fortunate enough to be part of, right. and um, and and then of course meeting many of the the, the people who uh, were instrumental to me. 
um, actually, as we were talking to, with you earlier in this very house, mm -hmm. um, um, before probably you were ever ever <laughs> knew about Lilydale, um, I, I used to come and sit in circles here uh, and uh, uh, learn learn learned a great deal from from those experiences. Yeah, so and, and so it was just continually um, learning about um, uh, predominantly the healing, and then. I think it was in, in the early 70s, uh, Reverend Ann Gaiman mm -hmm. introduced me to Andrew Jackson Davis. She handed me a book and she said, you might be interested in this. And uh, I was more than interested. Yeah. Once, I, once I started to read it, I said, this is what it's really about for me, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because it was the depth of philosophy, which I was looking for. Yes. Uh, I, needed, I needed more than just the phenomena. I needed the understanding behind it. Yes. Right? And... Um, the spiritual underpinnings. Exactly. Exactly. That's what I needed. And I, I, I found that in spades in Davis. More, more than just for spiritualism, but for, um, you know, for cosmology in general, if you will. Yes. <laughs> yeah. To having an understanding of, of how our universe works. Mm -hmm. Not just physically, but physically and spiritually. Yes. And that's one of the things that, that, that Davis brought to the table, um, and it's amazing that, that that has been kind of forgotten. Um, well, history Not just by way. spiritualists, and not, yeah. not just by spirit, but forgotten by the culture in general, mm -hmm. because he's the first person to bring together the discoveries of science with spirituality. That had really never been done before. Well, Emanuel Swedenborg had done that, and other. And other not folks. to the degree that, that, that right. Davis he, did. He did yeah. A lot. But yeah. yeah, I think there were definitely people that broke yeah. ground before him. Yeah. But yeah, there was there was certainly. He, yeah. Yeah, yeah but that from, he did more. So. Yeah, yeah, I think he did more. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, for instance, you know, in in Nature's Divine Revelation, which was his first uh, published work. And that book was was done in in a full trance state, and and it was. We should back time. up and, and explain yeah. a little bit about Andrew Jackson and what year what year was he born? Do you remember? Eighteen twenty six. Eighteen twenty six, and he was how old when he first? He was seventeen. He was eight, at age seventeen. Um, he grew up in dirt poor circumstances. Mm -hmm. His father was alcoholic. Right. Um, his mother was supportive of him. Uh, but you know, and she was um, uneducated. She had something of a a, um, a, a a spiritual bent to her, but it was very, very conventional. Yes. And uh, the amazing thing that that Davis he was always uh, aware of his circumstances, you know, acutely so, even as a kid. And you see that in his first autobiography, which he wrote when he was like. 28 years old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like a 500 page book. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, so anyway, at age 17, he became interested in mesmerism. Mm -hmm. uh, Which at, was really yeah, taking off during it, that yes, time. Yes, it was very popular, in, at least in the Northeast. You know, uh, 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 so he became uh, curious and interested, and it, uh, uh, as luck would have it, a, a traveling mesmerist was. Uh, in his community at the time, uh, in the Poughkeepsie area, that's what he's known as the Poughkeepsie Seer. So he um, set, set up a date, and it took about three times uh, for the mesmeric um, uh, passes to actually put him in another state. Okay. And mesmerism, interesting, when it first came about, was a healing modality. Yes, that's right? what I've read. It was a healing books. modality, and it looked very similar to some of the healing modalities today, mm -hmm. energetic healing modalities. Yes. Hand passes around the subject mm -hmm. uh, for up to uh, 45 minutes, if they say, you know, that, yes. which is a lot more than people t t tend to do it today. That's true. <laughs> it's an abbreviated version, especially with church styles. So exactly, <laughs> exactly. So up to 45 minutes, and on occasion, people would go into trance states. Sometimes very deep trance states. Well, on the third time, Davis went into a deep trance state, and it was discovered that he was capable of doing medical clairvoyance. Right. That he would diagnose and prescribe for illnesses, and diagnose giving precise medical terminology, 
which he could not have known because yeah. he was illiterate. Yeah, yep, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he was illiterate. And um, his um, operator, as they were called in those days, he and his operator decided they, they were going to do this for a living. Mm -hmm. And so for the next um, two and a half years, on a daily basis, that's what they did. And accurately. And very accurately. And about a year and a half or so into it, he was also given the guidance that you should assemble a group of people in New York City mm -hmm. for a series of lectures, mm -hmm. trans lectures. Right. So they got some illiterati from New York. They assembled a group of people, um, one, um, one of whom was a, uh, uh, a relative of pres the Bush presidents. Oh, long ago. <laughs> and he was a professor. He was a professor of Hebrew. Oh. Fine. In New York, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so he was there uh, um, uh, at these at these lectures, and these lectures went on for about a year and a half, mm -hmm. and basically they provided a new cosmology, mm -hmm. and what it was was bringing together the discoveries of science with um, with with philosophy and spirituality, in a w really in a way that had never been done before. If this wasn't even done to this degree by um, Swedenborg or, or others, because he got into the very specific detail of things like the surfaces of the planets in the solar system, yes. right? Um, some, some of which was, actually a good deal of which was verified later by space probes mm -hmm. 150 years later. Right. You know? so he also um, discussed um, two planets that hadn't even been discovered, Neptune and Pluto. And he knew about them because he was able to connect yes. with those spirit guides and teachers. Last week we had Judas Rochester yeah. on, and, and yeah. we were talking about the role of spirit guides and teachers that they can play. And in, in Andrew Jackson's early history, that was important for him to be able to, to yes. channel those yeah. of, particularly, of higher yeah. mind. Yes, particularly I think that, that was particularly important for him in his, in his um, psychological development. Mm-hmm. Because he was under a lot of strain, of course, as you would yeah, imagine. It's, it's physically you know? draining yeah. to be on in those kinds of ways. Yeah. And especially when you're breaking convention. Yes. <laughs> People don't always like that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I, I, I think I, you know, it's important, as you keep emphasizing yeah. uh, in our conversation, that he combined the, the science with the philosophy spirituality. and yeah. the spirituality. Because a lot of religions, it's mainly based on faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know the book that they can read and right. refer to as a reference manual, so to speak. <laughs> and uh, with this, it's a, a combination of factors, and right. that's what spiritualism is built upon—the idea of of the philosophy, the religion, and the science of spiritualism. Right. So you have those as combining factors. And one of the things I like to say, and, and, and sort of you know, and and Davis would be right behind this too, is that we are not a faith-based religion; we're an experience-based yes. religion. Yes. You know, so it's our internal experience that allows us um, to um, to have um, a sense of deeper understanding of who we are on a broader scale. Yes. So our experience with, as you said, spirit guides, our experience with other levels of consciousness. And personal experience. Yes. I think that was, you know, as far as the birth of modern spiritualism, the idea yeah. of you can have personal experiences, not yeah. just someone else dictating. Exactly, you, yes. That you will have a personal experience with, with spirit and allow the divine to guide you in your life. Right. And that's an important message of spiritualism throughout all these yes. years. Right, and, and that's that, to me, it's the egalitarian notion, you know, yes. non-hierarchical. <laughs> Yes. It's, it's non hierarchical. There, there's Everyone no little has, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everybody's got access. Yes. You know. And you know, again, you see this over and over again in Davis's writings, he talks about it. Yes. Um and encourages, mm -hmm. you know, people to, to um utilize their own access and um and actually dedicate themselves to it, you know, mm -hmm. dedicate themselves to their own progress. You know. So anyway, it, it, this this first um book uh, was compiled. These were full trans lectures, mm -hmm. uh, so he was not conscious of it. And they, um, this was all compiled in the first book, which was called Nature's Divine Revelation, A Message to Mankind. Take note of yeah. the title, folks. Yeah. <laughs> and that was published in 1847, a year before the Fox Sisters. Mm -hmm. 
No. And, and I really believe that it was instrumental in, in creating a, um, uh, a way of thinking or supporting a way of thinking that allowed the Fox sister phenomena to have context. Yes. Yeah, we, better context. Better context. <laughs> yeah. What yeah. was going on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So and I, I think it was very, very important. But also, I, I, and I also tell a lot of people this, it was, it was absolutely essential that it came through women. Mm. And tell them why you why you say that. Why do I why do I say that? Yeah. Because and even Davis will talk about how uh, women have had been um, uh, the the great sin of humanity was that um, half of um, humankind was in chains, <laughs> meaning women. Yes. You know. Yes. Right. And so this was um, the great. The great story was that it was coming through women. It was like saying, "Look, um, it's time. It's time for the feminine to be reintegrated mm -hmm. um, into the into society and to be fully utilized and appreciated." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that that anyway, that's yeah. another that's that, a kind that's of an aside, but, but it, it, I think it's important. It is important in in the idea that during that time in Victorian mm -hmm. times, women didn't have the uh, mm -hmm. Right or ability to to speak in public. That's right. And unless yeah. they were mediums, I mean, you can yeah. go and, and do a church lecture if you were yeah. a woman, yeah. but if you were a medium, you could. Right. And you could speak. Well, it helped to break. Yeah, it broke the ice on that, and women and and women started to say, you know, if I can do this, I can do that too. You know, yes. it's like yes. you know, what's this? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's yeah. definitely an yeah. important part yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, let's talk more about the scientific parts of things okay, that so, Davis was bringing forth, and and then I think we should probably take a, a caller. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, if we have some callers, yeah. So um, there's so many levels uh, um, that, that that he worked on, and uh, certainly evolution was a big part of his his um, uh, I don't know theoretical uh, constructs, if you will, because mm -hmm. he really. Um, years before Darwin, a few years, a number of years before Darwin, he had pretty much the same thing. And I think it might have been, you know, generally understood then that um, there was a progress in, um, uh, in life from, let's say, mineral to um, single cell to um, plant, animal, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the ladder of the species, if you will. Sure. Um, but what... Um, and Davis had that all mapped out and, and drawn up in some of his, his books. But what Davis had that was different from Darwin yes. was that it was all purposeful. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. there was an underlying... A divine purpose. There's an underlying intelligence and purpose behind it. Mm -hmm. and not intelligent design, by the way. Much more dynamic than that. Okay. That, that evolution is an ongoing process and actually... At, an aspect of the nature of the creator. Yes. That's different, you know, from um, from intelligent designs and, you know, there's a there's some wise guy up there and he's got it all, you know, drawn out. No, it's dynamic. It's in process. It's underway all the time. Well, when you think about, the, let's say, the, the symbol of a garden, you, you can yeah. try to prune that thing and control it as much as you want, but if you want a garden, you have to let parts of it be wild yeah. and grow as they will yeah. in divine intelligence. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's how it is for, for man. Mm -hmm. For man and for all life, mm -hmm. ultimately. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, uh, similar to this uh, lead beater with Andy Bassange, he was receiving in trans information the periodic table of elements. He was able to diagram mm -hmm. what those were, and later on, those were verified. So this is a time where people were really go, moving in a trance, receiving higher mm -hmm. information that they couldn't have even guessed about. Uh -huh. <laughs> right, right. And, and so what I love about learning about the folks from the past is that if they did it, we can do it too. Right. And certainly this is what Davis thought his and felt his... Mission was is to is is to provide roadmaps for people to do this. Yes. You know, and he, and I think he did a, a an incredible job with it. Mm -hmm. he, he, this is something that a lot of people don't know, 
um, even people in, involved in spiritualism, shortly after the publication of that first book, mm -hmm. um, he had a, a, a personal crisis. And that was, a, he was really upset that all this good stuff was happening and he wasn't there for it. <laughs> <laughs> and I can, I can certainly understand that. Yes, yes. And um, so, you know, he, he had it out with his guides. One of his guides, by the way, was Swedenborg. Yeah, and Emmanuel know Swedenborg, Swedenborg, the who, Swedish scientist. Yes, <laughs> you know, who's considered one of the um, um, one of the early um, sort of stepping stones for the development of of modern spiritualism. Yeah, he was someone who was very well respected. Yes, uh, internationally even. Yeah. Uh, as a scientist first, and when he right. was age fifty five, he started to have spirit contact and yes. spirit experiences and he wrote at length about them about what the spirit world was like mm -hmm. uh how it how the the hierarchy of mm -hmm. that all happened so yes the first book called heaven and hell and yes. his experiences with that yeah. yes and um and then he went on to write almost a, a volume uh, there's a few books that he didn't a volume uh, uh for every book of the Bible, giving its metaphysical interpretation. Ah! <laughs> you, you know, I think it's this was a Swedenborg, a Swedenborg yeah. Yeah. interpretation of that, um, yeah. from a scientific man, mind. Yeah, right, scientific <laughs> mind. Yeah, and some consider him to be one of the greatest intelligences to ever live, you know, right up there, you know, with, um, you know, with an Einstein or a Newton uh, and, and all of those, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, he was um, he was fluent in eleven different languages. Yes. Right. He um, he developed a couple of fields of mathematics. Um, uh, 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 mineralogist. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, there was something else that he did. He he he, he was a um, um, there was some art or craft that he had developed too that he was I can't remember what it is. A skill either. that he had yeah. also on top of everything else. Well, you know, when, when people are in that uh, creative, yeah. inventive space, yeah. it's in, it's incredible what it occurs right. within them. And a member of Swedish Parliament. Uh, and <laughs> yes, he did a lot politically yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he was certainly an active soul. But here's an interesting thing that happened to him. Um, when he was 56, he had very bad teeth. His mouth, they were all sort of rotten. I did and he not grew, this. And he grew right. an entire new set of teeth. What? Yeah. How? No one knows. <laughs> Yeah. Poor George Washington was yeah. stuck with his dentures, and, yeah. and there's Manuel Swedenborg. Yeah, there's Swedenborg <laughs> growing did it. him back. No one knows how or why, mm. but that's you know maybe maybe that was a you know a blessing or a gift he was given for changing direction in his life. I had not I heard don't know. that was. Yeah, yeah. So that's Swedenborg. I'm sure there are people who would like to know yeah. that method. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, Swedenborg, one of his guides, they um, uh, they convinced him. Um, that he needed to read and write, learn how to read and write, and they supported him, you know. I so he, he had help from, from people in the physical plate, but also simultaneously they were helping him to learn how to read and write. And they're like, let's progress this guy now. Yeah, <laughs> right. And so um, within a short time, he was no long, it was no longer necessary for him to be put into a trans state by another person, mm -hmm. that he could access those states at will. Well, eventually he, mm -hmm. he probably learned mm -hmm. what it felt mind by spirit to align himself for that purpose. Right. And was able to vibrationally maintain that right. at will. That's right. Yes. So I, I think that's probably why, how that happened. And another reason I believe that happened, too, is um, there's a famous story. And, it, it, and it, this is about his, um, it's the, also the title of his autobiography, The Magic, the magic Staff. And what The Magic Staff that's refers right. to is um, um, just a simple phrase, mm -hmm. you know, and so it, 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 it was a difficult time in his life and um, his spirit guides came to him and they, they flashed before him, um, uh, I, kind of like in blazing letters, this phrase, under all circumstances keep an even mind. When you read about it in his autobiography, you get the sense that this wasn't just reading something. It was affecting his con entire consciousness, mm -hmm. you know. So it wasn't just, you know, when, when, when you read about it, you get the sense, okay, he just read this thing, this message in the sky or something. Mm -hmm. Well, no, there's, there's something that happened for him simultaneously, internally, 
So it was like the eset, the essence of the message was implanted in him. Yes. Okay. Now, but I believe it was kind of already there in a lot of ways. I think it's in all of us. Right. But but when you look at look back in his history and you see some things that that occurred in his childhood even. And he had to keep an even mind. He was he did a lot in his life, but this sort of like stamped it permanently. It was like, no, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example. This is oh. in earlier in his in childhood. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Anyway, I'll just go through this yes. first. Mm -hmm. So anyway, he's he's about eleven or twelve, and um, a friend of him, uh, his lends him a horse. He, he goes into the neighboring town, goes into the general store to pick something up, mm -hmm. and as when he's coming out, there's a group of young um, toughs there, and they see this is a kid from out of town. Yep. We're gonna mess with him. Mm -hmm. So they start messing with him, push him around, and and the, and the biggest of the bullies starts really shoving him knocks him to the ground and starts pummeling him. Mm -hmm. Now, as he's being beaten up by this kid, he gets this internal message, show no anger. Mm. And somehow he was able to kind of just hold it all in, not be the slightest bit angry over what was going on. He said, it certainly hurt, and I, but he gave me tears and I cried. He said, but almost instantly, the, the, the boy who was beating him stopped. And it's like, and he got up and dusted, and he got up and dusted himself off, tears and all, and got on his horse and went back. Well, shortly after that, within a month or two, his family moved into that town. He found himself in the same general store, and there was the kid that and beat him up. That? He didn't even recognize Davis. Davis <laughs> recognized him. Yes. And they started. How can you forget? <laughs> they started a conversation and became friends. Mm -hmm. And. Later on, um, you know, within a couple of months, they're sitting by a stream bed and they're just just um, communicating, talking with each other. And the, um, the the boy says to him, "You know, something happened to me, and, and he says I, I have to confess something, and it's been bothering me ever since." Um, this kid came into town, and I just like jumped in, I started beating him, and he says, "You know, I it's just you know." Davis says, "Don't worry, that was me." And forgiveness and grace. Yeah, and great. Yeah, uh, spiritual, uh, natural law of grace. And, and so you know, nice. and they had become friends. But I think the, the it's, it's one of those turn the other cheek stories. Yes, yes. But well, the interesting part about this turn the other cheek is how it affected the consciousness of the bully. Yes, because he wasn't uh, in a space of having to resist or exactly. There was nothing to. You know, push back. Gonna to push him. back on, on yeah. that, and I think that's something that you know throughout time. Yeah, that, that's a universal message. That idea of keeping an even mind, because yes. I've noticed that the more you have an aggressive emotional response of something, it cements that karmic entanglement further. Absolutely, and actually snarls it up more. Mm -hmm. Not that you can't have opinions. Not that you can't have emotions, but we have to watch our moods and modes. Yeah, and, and, and also, to me, this part speaks to the bigger issue of what Davis was trying to present to the public, and, mm -hmm. and, and that developing your spiritual um, gifts is, is wonderful and good, um, but, uh, and, and in the psychic aspect of that and so on and so right. forth. But um, the, real, the real cherry on the top is... Um, is moral courage and strength. Yeah. And every great um, spiritual leader, you see that evidenced in their lives. You know, from Jesus to the Buddha to all of them. The different saints. Right. And the, Jimmy, there, was, <laughs> there was great, there was a great moral strength at their core. Mm -hmm. And I've often asked myself about this. It's like, why Davis being, having a gift as unique as he had. And I've done a lot of study on mystics yes, and so right. on. Tom um, is a healer. Yeah. That's what you do professionally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and teach healing, too. Yeah. So I, I, studying the various mystics throughout history, and it was difficult to find, it's difficult to find examples that even measure up to Davis, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. in all of history. It, you know, uh, in terms of the breadth of what he was, what was able to do. Uh, and he wrote something like 26, 28 books uh, in his lifetime, 
Most of them about 500 pages long or longer. Mm-hmm. This from <laughs> you know, a, no, a former yeah. illiterate. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it just goes to show you that when you when you want to be a sponge to that which is of yeah. the divine, things can progress rapidly. Yeah. And not instant mashed potatoes, but the idea of it's going to take some time, but yeah. you can get there and yes. and get to uh, an understanding of spiritual um, the spiritual underpinnings, the spiritual principles. Principles, as, yeah. As you said. Oh, I, I want to okay, take good. a caller. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. This would be a uh, caller ending in 2911. Again, 2911. And welcome to the show. Hello? Hi, thanks for taking my call. Yes, Hi. and what's your name and where are you calling from? My name is Terry and I'm calling from Rhode Island. Terry from Rhode Island. And what's your question about today? I was tuning in. Um, you know, I've gone through a transformative couple of years myself due to loss and rebuilding, sort of just navigating life. And um, it, it rests upon me a spiritual awakening of sorts. So I'm interested in the topic, and I do believe in the regeneration and how, you know, it can be applied in life. It's just trying to stay grounded, I think, is the biggest challenge for me especially when there are others around you who, you know, you're not trying to impose your beliefs upon them, but also can kind of see differently now, like, the inner self versus the outer self and where the motivations are coming from. So any thoughts that you may have on that, on how to stay, how one could stay grounded, you know, when surrounded by others who may not be maybe on the same rung of the spiritual ladder of life? <laughs> well, you know what, I think, um, do you have a meditation practice, Carrie? Uh, like mm-hmm. it's, it's Terry. No, good, good. Well, I think that's probably one of the most important things you uh, um, you can do is to continue that. And as you do, mm-hmm. I think you'll find that it's just going to get deeper. Mm-hmm. And um, there's so much one learns from the, from a meditation practice. And, and Davis. Uh, you're talking about how, how this may fit into Davis. Yes. Um, he spent a lot of time um, uh, going into uh, deeper states of consciousness. Mm-hmm. Uh, and th- that was his anchor. That enabled him mm-hmm. to do, yeah, to, to stay centered. Um, and he faced enormous challenges in his life. Very much so. And, you know, with all, with this, you know, the moving into other consciousness, it's interesting when I'm doing my mediumship work, all things kind of go to the wayside. I, it's just me, my client and spirit and in that bubble and everything else drops away. And so it is when, when you truly enter into that communion with the divine, with your own soul, uh, other things uh, don't take as much precedence and people can't pull you off uh, kilter so much during that time, even though mm-hmm. you're more sensitive from one perspective, it helps you to help other people and to be grounded in those ways for, for them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And he, you know, in Davis's time, he faced all kinds of criticism, you know, because he was, he, he was attacking spiritual convention. <laughs> that's not, um, um, that's not easy to do at any time, but, um, let me just read you a, um, uh, an interesting uh, uh, paragraph from his autobiography. Uh, and it relates to the subject that you brought up here, Terry. Uh, Prejudice is impudent as idiotic and merciless as erroneous. Of this, my private history is a demonstration. Minds too blunted to feel a truth and too indolent to examine a principle are the first to cry mad dog and shout infidel. Hoots, hisses, and silly exclamations reached my outer ear almost every day. Sunday school boys would chalk vulgar words upon our cottage fence and gateposts. Students of Cicero, Xenophon, Locke, Bacon, and Divinity would echo in public the ridicule which salary professors oftentimes whispered in private. And young ladies, too, not overstocked with the charity which thinketh no evil, but imbibing in prejudice of preceptus or minister or parents, all equally misinformed, would nervously ejaculate cunning little epithets and harmless satires with which they sought to check the progress of our movement. What was all this to me? 
amusement and nothing more. In the blue sky, I had friends stable as the everlasting mountains. You know, you, you do move in, in into a place of, of God divine holding you and protecting you. Yes. Um, when you go through difficulties. And that helps you to be grounded. I think it's it's good to surround yourself with spiritual food, good books that call, that uh, attune mm -hmm. those inner forces. And so there in Rhode Island, Terry, do you have a, um, a, a community, that, a spiritual community, or at least a group of friends that you can connect with? Uh, yeah. Church here. Oh, good. All the different groups. Good, good. Excellent. I find all of that that also very, very supportive and and reinforcing. And inspiring. Inspiring. Yeah. Well, thank you for calling in today, thank Terry. You. We really appreciate you calling and thank tuning in. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. -bye. Bye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think it's it's as much as Andrew Jackson Davis in our day and time has a lot of highfalutin words for some folks. Right. <laughs> um, they, there's a beauty to, to the cadence of all of that. Yes. And I, I think that w having those kinds of words infiltrate into our consciousness helps yeah. too. They tended to be a little more flowery in the yeah, 19th so century. Yeah, we used to. That, it, yeah, they, that, that was... they knew more words, it would seem. I think so. <laughs> But, you know, the, the gist of that is beautiful. Yeah. I really appreciate you sharing about that. Yeah. Uh, time is going so fast. Let's take one more caller, and then we should talk about sure. uh, some super consciousness and Edgar Casey if we have a chance. Yeah. I'm going to take caller number 2158. Again, 2158. Hi. Hi. What's your name and where are you calling from? Laura. Could you say that again, please? I'm calling from State College, Pennsylvania. Did you say Lori? Uh, I have a... No, Dolores. Oh, Dolores. Okay, Dolores. thank you. No. <laughs> <laughs> and what's your question uh, I, for today? I saw my, I saw my holistic practitioner yesterday, and she said that uh, I've been having muscular issues, which is really weird, like on the left side, and it can get painful. Okay, feedback. And, so. the topic. Yeah, is it, we're, um, we are talking about Andrew Jackson Davis and he did have the ability to diagnose and prescribe and, and do things like that, but that's not what we can offer on the show, Dolores, I'm sorry. And, um, you know, I, I don't think that, see, we focus mm. more on spiritual healing and the that which is prayerful and purposeful on that. We don't do medical diagnosis. I apologize. <laughs> Well, um, you know, there are, there are often some very, very, I believe some of the, the simplest um, visualizations that you can do um, to invite in healing energy. Yes. You know, if you just begin to imagine that the, um, the infinite healing light and love of God is coming into you from all directions um, as you're breathing. Okay? Like, like if you breathe on, on every in-breath, you're letting in more and more light and energy, and it can be targeted to uh, the areas of your body where the condition is worst. Absolutely. You know, where you feel the condition. Mm -hmm. And the other piece is just being open to that being um, uh, altered in whatever way necessary. So sometimes as you're breathing in that light and energy, you may feel the color change, or you may feel a frequency or a sound vibration coming in to support or your health and your condition. Or a temperature too. difference, yeah. exactly. All of those kinds of things, okay. very, very, it's a very simple, but often a very powerful way of engaging in your meditation and opening up to the healing um, presence of the divine. 
and it offers a good reset for okay. you, for your body, mind, and soul. Too. Yes. So you know, meditation is okay. one thing, but visualization, as Tom said, is an excellent tool as well. So I hope you apply that, Dolores. <laughs> yes, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Have a wonderful day, and thanks for calling in today. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. And so you know, healing is something that we all. Um, at some point in our lives or throughout our lives, yeah. we, we have different instances that we're calling upon the divine to help, yes. help, help us. And, and sometimes we need uh, someone to witness our healing. Yes. And I find that to be, uh, talk about amplification. Witness, witnessing is a tremendous amplification of healing. Yes. And, I, and sometimes I believe that's all you do. Now, a spiritual healer, and I, I teach this in my classes too, I said, you know, you don't do anything but witness. Yes. That's all we do. We watch what it is that the divine and the higher self of whoever it is what we're working with mm -hmm. wants to manifest for them. Right. And the better watcher you are, mm -hmm. the more likely the manifestation is to happen. Yes. The, <laughs> the more you, you put that gentle request out and accept it. Healing is yeah. about what we allow. And allowing and, and trusting that those things are moving yeah. forward and, and what we can learn through our healing process. Because mm -hmm. it's not about the destination, it's about the journey, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I think we should mention real quickly uh, the correlation with Edgar Casey because he is also someone who's uh, went right. into trance, did medical intuition similar to right. what Andrew Jackson Davis offered. Right. And why don't you tell them briefly, we just have a few minutes left. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Literally, it goes by so fast. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Well, it, you know, most people in the 20th century know about uh, Edgar Cayce, at least in the second half of the 20th He's century. He's considered the sleeping prophet. The sleeping so prophet, So we have Andrew right. Jackson Davis, who's the Gypsy Seer, and then we yeah. have the sleeping prophet. The sleeping prophet. Edgar Cayce. And Edgar Cayce, almost exactly the same kind of early history, only, only what Cayce never did was he never just took the jump into doing the superior condition. Right. If we have time, I can get into I that. Know, but, I know, I <laughs> know. <laughs> but, um, but, um... Uh, for gosh, twenty, thirty years, what the good thing that they did uh, around Casey's work was he had a secretary that um, um, that that recorded everything that recorded everything and wrote down every session and, and everything that was prescribed and diagnosed, including many, many things that dealt with people's past lives mm -hmm. and their emotional, psychological history, right? As they related to past lives, so. We get a lot of um, uh, information from Casey on uh, on Atlantis and Lemuria and some of these like these and sort he, of he did ancient, make predictions yeah. as well. And he did make some predictions as well. And there are yeah. some wonderful books on Edgar Casey. I think it's important to mention that at the Edgar Casey, um, what's that called? AR. Area um, Association AR, for Research and Enlightenment. That's where they have a lot of Andrew Jackson Davis's. His things yes there. his. Yeah, his uh, effects from his family and stuff that, that, that they managed to, to, to get them there. I think they have his cane. They have some other things. And his that's personal in effects. Virginia Beach area, isn't it? It's in Virginia Beach. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if anybody's interested more about Andrew Jackson Davis, you can certainly um, take a look at Andrew Jackson Davis's books. But if you're happy to go through... Uh, right, and we have a wonderful... Uh, uh, here in Lilydale, we have a wonderful Andrew Jackson Davis uh, collection in our library. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But, um, You're in Skidmore Library here in yeah, the mm -hmm. Yeah, but anybody who's really, really curious and interested in, in, in this, a couple of things. Certainly, um, his autobiography is a good start, and that's called The Magic Staff. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I highly recommend that. The, the, the other book that I highly recommend for those who really want to get an in-depth understanding of, of the mind and the levels of the mind, levels of perception, understanding how how perception is the is is the backbone of uh, of spiritual growth and development. It's the third volume of the Harmonial Philosophy. Ninety seconds. Yeah. And, and Harmonial Philosophy is is something that Andrew Jackson Davis kind of founded, if you right. will. Um, mm -hmm. He he did have some time uh, as spiritualism, but he also did the Harmonial Philosophy. And he is uh, responsible for, for helping spiritualism to have a Sunday school program that's right. called the Lyceum. The Lyceum for program. those of you here in Lilydale, uh, you know the Lyceum is at the Children's Acre, the, our playground area. And 
Uh, it says Andrew Jackson Davis Lyceum for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> so those are all tidbits. We just have 60 seconds. I, I want to mention, um, you know, Tom Tom has a website, tomcratsley.com, mm -hmm. and he has a guest house the, um, that, that he runs here. Yeah. And uh, his wife, Ellie, is a registered medium. So he's yes. a long time here. And Lily Dale knows a lot about healing. I know you've got healing classes probably coming up. Oh, yes, yes. We, I do a healing mastery class mm -hmm. every summer uh, through Lily Dale. Mm -hmm. I'm also involved in the, um, the School of Healing and Prophecy here. Mm -hmm. We train spiritualist ministers. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and it's a fellowships of the spirit. That's, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's not much time to I know, there's not much time, but just it, but, take a look at, at yeah. Tom Cratsley's website, yeah. TomCratsley.com. Yeah. And I hope that you all enjoyed learning about Andrew Jackson Davis. Thank you for tuning in today. And we really appreciate you. Uh, we'll, we'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye.